again and welcome to another episode of the Hyperion Adventures Podcast. I'm Tom. As always, I'm with my gorgeous, wonderful, intelligent, hard-working, classic Disney Parks restaurant <laughs> loving wife and co-host, Michelle. Well, thank you, honey. I'm not even sure the title of this episode. <laughs> I did something. It was like uh, old school Disney... Walt Disney World and Disneyland restaurants from the past. Yeah, something like that. So I just kind of figured <laughs> you're in the ballpark, like you know, well, like good. like if you are, you maybe not on the bullseye of that target, but you're definitely on the board. Wow, <laughs> it's good to be in the ballpark. Anyway, usually I'm sitting outside, just hoping I, just trying to peek over the fence, hoping I can get in, or maybe that someone will hit a home run over the fence and I'll get them rewarded that way. It doesn't help that. That I don't share with you much, and and these things, as I'm doing research, really morph into way different directions than I started. Yes, uh, if you remember last week when I mentioned the <laughs> title of this, I like just saw it on our calendar because we have a calendar for all our topics, and I had no idea really what it meant. <laughs> it was even abbreviated at some point, so I'm like, I think I have an idea of what she's trying to say here, but I don't really know. So. We'll see how today goes. Yes. And we appreciate that you're uh, joining us today. We are recording this episode on Sunday, October 10th, 2021. Thank you for joining us. In the future, you can find us most everywhere you get podcasts. However, the very best place to find us is on our own website, HyperionAdventuresPodcast.com. And while you're there... We'd really appreciate it if you sign up for our newsletter. Yeah, please sign up for the newsletter. Just another way to be involved in the Hyperion Adventures podcast world. We were a day late getting out the, <laughs> <laughs> the, the newsletter this week, Sorry. but we did get it out there. <laughs> uh, Michelle had much of the week off, so we were doing some things around the house and taking up our time. And I was slacking on getting the newsletter. Yeah, but I still slacking. got it out to you this week. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and you weren't slacking. You were helping out. And anyways. Anyway. <laughs> uh, another way to follow along with this is on social media. Please check us out on Twitter at Hyperion Podcast, Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest at Hyperion Adventures Podcast. If you are on Facebook, come on down and join us in the Hyperion Adventurers Facebook group where we're having a lot of positive Disney energy fun with a lot of our friends. Right. And we got some good responses for uh, part of today's episode from that group today. And we also um, received some interesting, fun news that yes. will also be part of this episode today. Yeah, it's a great group. Uh, we really enjoy all of you who are, are participating in there and following there. Please invite your friends to join along too. Yes, please. Please bring everybody along. We're having it. The group is growing. It uh, seems yeah. like every day and that's great. And uh, we'd like you to come on in and join the fun and your friends and your family and everybody else. So yeah. you can also find us on YouTube. We're mostly releasing these episodes on YouTube, but every once in a while we'll drop something else a little different there. Uh, just do a quick search for Hyperion Adventures podcast, hit subscribe, and you know whenever we have a new video there. And if you ever want to contact us for any reason, please hit us up at our Gmail account, Hyperion Adventures podcast at gmail.com. That's right. We love hearing from you all, as we mention every week, uh, but we also get things clarified from our, our podcast episodes, or if you have a topic you really want us to do a deep dive in, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, even if you just want to say hi, whatever. Yeah. Um, we, you know, and this is true of every podcast. Uh, input is so important. Mm -hmm. One, you know, we just sit here and we talk to each other. We talk into microphones right. every single week. We love to know that there's somebody out there on the other end of this <laughs> actually listening to these. Yes, we can see downloads and some other things, but when we get input, uh, whether it be through social media, whether it be through the email, whatever, comments, uh, reviews, anything like that, I, it makes us feel that much better about what we're doing every week. Yeah, and we love getting the interaction too, because I know like when I'm listening to other podcasts, it's like sometimes I feel like, you know, Oh, I want to tell them this, or mm -hmm. why didn't they think of this? And you know, and we want to hear all of that. Yeah. Uh, so please send it to us. Again, it doesn't matter how. It could be through the Gmail account. It can be through social media. We would just like to know that you're listening and what you're enjoying. What uh, if we're making some mistakes? We'd like to know those too because we'd like mm -hmm. to correct those. And of course, we would give you full credit for them. Um, we don't get everything right. That's for sure. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes I think we don't get very much right, <laughs> but right. we'd like to do our best for them. So yes, uh, and reviews, of course, are very helpful. Another way you could help this show and supported is uh, by chiming in through either our Spreadshirt shop and getting picking up some of the merchandise we have there. Yes, of course, we have t-shirts, but we have lots of 
other different things with our various different logos there that you could purchase. Or you can become a Patreon member on our Patreon page, patreon.com slash Hyperion Adventures podcast with tiers as low as $2 per month. Lots of great goodies there and some other things coming. Disney dishes, blog stuff that we share with you there that you only get there as well. Um, we would love to have you help us out, support the show, and uh, just be another, it's another way to be involved in the world. Exactly. And we really appreciate those of you who have already uh, joined in the Patreon group and mm -hmm. we hope you're enjoying your swag, etc. Yes. And we have more stuff coming from you. I already have plans for some <laughs> things, including eventually we're going to get together and have a, 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 where you are, who are Patreon members mm -hmm. are going to be joining us in on an episode. Yeah. That's going to be a lot of fun as well. If you want to, if you want to just, you know, be part of it and not take part in any of the right. stuff that we have, that's fine too. Whatever you like to do, we appreciate. So I was mentioning input earlier. Well, we got a lot of input for our next category for our Hyperion Adventures Disney Hall of Fame. We've closed mm -hmm. out another category, opened a new one as well. Yeah. But first, let's get to the one that we've closed out, and that is Best Classic Disney Parks Attraction. Now, if you remember last year, uh, there were two that made it in, were nominated, got enough of the percentage of the votes to get into the Hall of Fame, mm -hmm. and those were the Haunted Mansion and Pirates of the Caribbean. So those are off the table for for uh, this year's category. But everything else was wide open. All it had to be is a classic Disney attraction, meaning it had to be open in the parks prior to 1990. They could be open now. They could be closed now. They could be reimagined. It doesn't really matter. Just whatever you prefer. And we are going to get to our final list here. But first, we always like to give you our lists as well. <laughs> and we always start with Michelle One because she's wonderful, awesome, all things great. She does so the sweet. best research. Of course, mm. she has the best tips, definitely. But she also has the very best list. So Michelle, uh, give us your list of nominees for Best Classic Disney Parks Attraction. All right. So again, in no particular order. But now that I'm looking at my list, four out of the five begin with an S. Isn't that funny? Hmm. Oh. All right. So uh, there's the Skyway. Okay. Uh, the People Mover. Okay. The, uh, it's a Small World, which I guess it's there's an s within it <laughs> yes small, <laughs> small world <laughs> um spaceship earth uh -huh. and star tours okay great list yeah, thank you great list. thank you what about yours uh, my list, uh, again, also in no polit uh, particular order or political order. I know, I'm like, whoa, yes. what? <laughs> uh, we don't get political on the show, even with our uh, choice choices for the Hall of Fame. Uh, mine are Mission to the Moon slash Mars, which mm -hmm. I still wish exists. Right. But I see a little piece of that in Space 220 and right. some of the, uh, the elevator scenes that I've seen yeah. coming from that. Looking forward to experiencing that ourselves. Spaceship Earth. Yes, mm -hmm. I agree with you on that. Yes. It's a small world. Yeah. I agree with you as well. Uh, Adventure Through Inner Space, which I don't believe Michelle ever no. got to experience, was a Disneyland attraction. It was where Star Tours now is. And it was kind of a cool, like the, the, the premise was you were shrunk to atomic size and you right. got to, you know, go through all these atoms and right. parts of the, it was, it was a really cool attraction. Yeah. I really loved it. There's things out there. I've seen things out there about it. It does look cool. And, you know, then it, you, I guess they could bring it back if they wanted to tie it in like with Ant-Man or yeah, whatever. Yeah, it would be something that they definitely could uh, try and pull off again. It was yeah. really fun. And sure. Mission to, to Mars. I mean, come on, there's so much out there about you know, space travel now, actual space travel with, you know, not all being astronauts anymore, citizens, et cetera. It's like, that would be great to bring that back. Yeah, it was a pretty simple attraction, but it was fun. I yeah. loved it. I miss it uh, very much. Uh, my final one is Star Tours as well. So right. Star Tours wow. is on my list. So here is the list of the final ballot nominees. They will be on our final ballot come here uh, in late November in through December uh, leading up to our Hall of Fame. And they are... Uh, in alphabetical order. Okay. Uh, Adventure Through Inner Space did make it. Wow. Big Thunder Mountain okay, did make yeah, it. The yeah. mountains are very well represented in this. Yeah. Uh, Carousel of Progress nice. made it through. Uh, it's a Small World. Yay. Yes. 
A Jungle Cruise made it in. That one almost happy. made my list. Yeah, it could have made mine, except for I knew it was making it through. Yeah, so. I kind of figured it was going to make it. It was it, actually so. uh, very highly nominated yeah, by several people, so it doesn't surprise me, especially with the movie coming out. So right. And the new reimagining, it's, it's yeah. like even more to the forefront this year than right. before. The Matterhorn Bobsled's another mm-hmm. one that could have made my mm-hmm. list. It's solely classic. Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. Yeah, I kind of figured that would make it. Yeah. P- people who love it in Disneyland, people who miss it at Walt Disney I World. Know. You know? <laughs> Uh, Peter Pan's Flight, another one that could have yeah. made my list for sure. Uh, Spaceship Earth did make mm-hmm. it. Um, I forgot to add it in, so it's kind of out of alphabetical order slightly, but the Skyway did okay. make it Yay. in. Yes. Uh, let's see, where was I? Splash Mountain made it in. Nice. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Did I say Space Mountain? You did. Okay. Uh, Star Tours did okay. make it. Uh huh. The Walt Disney Railroads. So I, I some Ooh. people said the Disneyland Railroad. Some people just said the Railroads. Right. But I'm just going to say both of them since right. we're no particular we're trying to. It doesn't matter. Like when Pirates or Haunted Mansion made it in last year, right. we weren't specifying whether it was the Disneyland version or the Walt Disney World version. Okay. So just the Walt Disney Railroads did make it in. And finally, another one that could have made my list easily, and that is Walt Disney's Enchanted Tiki Room. Mm-hmm. So, uh, great list and yeah. looking forward to, uh, you know, getting those voted on coming up. Now we have a new category open for you right now if you want to get your nominations in. And this one is a tough one because it's very wide open. And it was so tough last year that no one got a, uh, enough of the votes to make it mm-hmm. in. So, but it is a category we're doing again, and that is Best Disney Song. So right. that is very that wide, is open. wide open. It is tough to get down to five. Well, that's why we always say five-ish. This right. is the Hyperion Adventures podcast. <laughs> if you want to put six, if you want to put seven, right. that's fine. Just send us your your five-ish favorite Disney songs, and th- those that get the most uh, nominations will make it to our final ballot. Nice. Yeah. So once again, though, we have another category that – it is always interesting for us because we never know if Michelle's going to remember to do this, although she's been <laughs> much more consistent with it re- recently, so I may have to stop saying that. Uh, and that is our new topic that we kind of share every single week, and that is my favorite thing from this week. Michelle, did you remember to do it this I week? I did remember. That's it. She's been consistent. Now, that's the last time I will mention that she, wonder if she remembers or not until she forgets again. I know. Yeah, I might not need to totally throw out that phrase. <laughs> But right. Um, yeah, mine is it's kind of broad is uh, and you kind of mentioned it a little earlier. I did have uh, several days off this past week and got to it, it wasn't as originally planned of what the week was going to consist of. Um, but it ended up being marvelous because I got to spend more mm-hmm. time with you and with Scott and just really enjoyed that time together that was that was a great time this Mm -hmm. week Um, we did uh, some work around the house spent uh, portions of our day doing that and portions of our day just relaxing and you know hanging out having a glass of wine having some snacks and and just enjoying time together and that was a really great thing yeah and i feel bad now because i did not have that listed as my favorite thing (laughs) from this week even though it should have been no no um i just didn't think of it but uh yes now that that may have been really my favorite thing from this week but i'll go for my second favorite okay. thing from this week, <laughs> and that was Muppets Haunted Mansion. Yeah, on that one Radio almost Lewis. made mine. Yeah. That almost made mine. Yep. Oh, so good. Yes, uh, that was amazingly good. I mean, it hit all the notes as far as you know whether you're a Muppets fan, whether you're a Haunted Mansion fan, right. Disney Parks fan, Halloween fan. It it hit everything. And it, it may be the best thing the Muppets have put out since the Muppets movie with right. Jason Siegel, Amy Adams mm-hmm. in that. Um, if you're a Haunted Mansion fan, it may even rank higher than right. that. It yeah. was really, really well done. Yeah, it, re- it really was. I put out on our group that, you know, it, it really is worth seeing. We loved it. Um, I think we enjoyed also watching Scott get excited and laughing at a lot of the scenes, too. So, but yeah, it's, it, it really was a great Great film and a uh, new annual Halloween tradition, I think, for us. No, oh, yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah. We're going to be watching it over and over again yeah. over the next few weeks. Uh, it's really, really good. So if you haven't checked it out yet, it's on Disney+. Plus. Uh, please do. It's under an hour, but it's 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 really great. And yeah. It's just a lot of fun. Cute. Yeah. A lot, a lot of, um, you know, star cameos right. in it, as you would expect. You know, a lot of touches you know uh easter eggs through the haunted mansion oh, yeah, so um through the muppets including the muppet show mm-hmm. and everything it's just really really cool so uh highly recommend it now we did get a one 
fantastic yes. and cool uh, piece of input from one of our Hyperion adventurers right. who wanted to chime in on uh, my favorite thing from this week. And that was from Jonathan who hit us up on our Hyperion adventurers mm-hmm. Facebook group. And he said, favorite thing from this week? Making it to round two Woo-hoo! of the planned Disney application Yay. process. Congratulations, yeah, Jonathan. Bravo. That's fantastic. I've applied every year now, he goes on to say, since 2017, but never made it to round two until now. That's awesome. Yeah. And, uh, really, uh, planned Disney could not do better than right. Jonathan. Um, yes. He would be a perfect choice for them. I know they're heading to Walt Disney World. I think they're excited to because they have to do it. If you've never uh, done either the Disney Parks Moms panel, which now is planned Disney, mm-hmm. uh, round two of the process to get you through, there's all usually you have to answer some questions, but there's also an, a question they have to do a video right. form of. Uh, they're going to be at Walt Disney World. I think they're planning out some fun yes. ways to shoot that video while they're at Walt Disney world yeah I, I i think that's a great uh setting to be able to do it in uh but like you said uh plan disney couldn't do better mm-hmm. i mean i jonathan is a wealth of knowledge uh, the warmest most sincere person um great entire family mm-hmm. actually and we're just excited right. and thinking and wishing great thoughts for success on round two. Yes. And to all those who have made it through to round two, who have uh, put their hat in the ring, mm-hmm. essentially to uh, try and be, take on this uh, position to, you know, basically aid visitors right. to uh, whether it be Disneyland, Walt Disney World, Disney Cruise, Disney Vacation Club, right. all those uh, to try and help people, uh, serve, you know, especially in these tough times where things are changing all the time to help them through right. all the questions. Um, and, and, you know, and you don't get really paid for this job. Yeah. It's yeah. Like you get a vacation, you, and there's some, some other perks as well that come along with it. Um, but you, you're putting in hours and time, and um, you know we appreciate that you're just willing to do that. Right. And so congratulations to everybody who made round two, and for those of you who didn't, uh, you know, the, next year, yeah. the year after, and we know you're paying. You're, you're, <laughs> yes, we do that too. Your time is coming, uh, so keep at it and keep up the good work. So um, good job by all of you. Yeah. So, uh, let's get to actually this week's episode. We have lots of. Stuff for you this week, including if you have been wondering when you'll be able to access Genie Plus at Walt Disney World, well, it's coming soon, and we'll tell you all about that. Uh, speaking of the most magical place on earth, we received some great news about entertainment that will be returning there in the near future. Uh, back over here on our coast at the Disneyland Resort, we got news about a fun new shop aimed at you holiday fans that will be opening soon as well. And not to be outdone, Disney Cruise Line had some news for us this week about some cool spaces for kids, tweens, and teens aboard the brand new yeah. Disney Wish. But enough of this. <laughs> Let's get to it. Let's get to our main topic of the week. Yeah, so I guess, you know, with the whole Walt Disney World's 50th birthday and everything, Michelle got a little nostalgic for the past. Uh, So she came up with this concept of what if we look back at some of the old school Magic Kingdom restaurants that are long gone from the past. And she's like, well, why don't you do some too? So we we extended it to now it's the old school Magic Kingdom and Disneyland restaurants from the past. Um, I don't know what Michelle came up with, how she's going to look at this. I just went through and, you know, my research, not nearly as good as Michelle's research. Let's be really honest with this. So my part, probably pretty small, not that big a thing, but Michelle is going to be great here with hers. Right. Uh, and I'll be interested because um, obviously I didn't get to the Magic Kingdom until, you know, well into the, into the I guess it was the relatively early 2000s mm-hmm. when I finally got there. She, uh, so, um, but you know, a lot of the first three decades, I didn't, there were a lot of restaurants and parts of Walt Disney world mm-hmm. that I didn't get to experience. So I'm interested to hear about some of these restaurants. So Michelle, tell all our listeners, <laughs> tell me what you know about these great restaurants, these OG restaurants from magic kingdom in the past. All right. Well, thank you. And, um, hopefully this will be a smooth intersection of our topics and I'm not sure. (laughs) 
so when I first started doing the research, I thought I was going to zig and I ended up zagging. Oh, boy. All right. And so, um, you know, I, again, originally I was thinking, OK, let's just talk about some, like you said, some of the early day, the nostalgic look at the restaurants that have since left or gone or changed or whatever. But then I started really, as I was doing the research, finding some interesting pearls and thinking, okay, I'm just going to hone in on a, on some of the more interesting concepts and stories. Um, so, and, and really mainly about Magic Kingdom. And my approach was also to look at opening day things and, and how they evolved from there. So that was kind of the premise of once I started, you know, formulating today's episode but okay. feel free to chime in or if you want to even initiate with some things there i'm happy to turn the floor over to you for a bit as well no i'm just looking forward to hearing about all these restaurants i looked at it and i'd I like you I, I didn't hit every single restaurant from right. disneyland that is no longer there or has changed but just some that were kind of interested me that i i found in my you know limited research that i did <laughs> uh so it'll be interesting to see but i'm sure yours will blow it all away oh, so we'll let's see. get to it here all right so you know um in you know, looking back when you're trying to find out what restaurants are there, you know, we think of the guide maps and things. But um, in my research, according to the Walt Disney Archives, the first Walt Disney World maps weren't a guidebook as we know it today. They actually had a, like a little newspaper uh, and it was called the Walt Disney World News. You know, and so it just it was different uh, in each page. It kind of gave you information. The map was just very generic. It's it's kind of like just listing the lands as like um just kind of blocks blocks nothing yeah specific within right them. right it didn't have like the little drawings of all the little you know locations of each thing it just had them listed in terms of attractions uh food and refreshments shops etc but that's where it also included the names of the food and refreshment locations so looking at one that was um, posted on disney parks blog um, and actually, they posted it, I think, on the 40th anniversary of the Magic Kingdom. But they uh, that the first one that they listed, it was called Vacation Kingdoms Open, you know, and I, it seems like it must have been written for the original big event that was towards the end of October, because this one actually had information about the first guests, which we discussed in, in last episode about the countdown. So that being said, even within having that information in my research, I found that even with very reliable Disney company resources, there was some conflicts. <laughs> Funny. <laughs> I know, what? Uh, so more details will come as we go along. But I thought, wow, it, you know, usually when I go to, you know, some of the tried and true real, like I said, the ones th that Disney puts out, you know, you have some consistency and, and there was some lacking, but there's some some information I'm about that. I'm glad I didn't put all, all the work that you put in. There. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, I actually put a, more hours, I think, into this episode than most of the look backs <laughs> just because I was trying to confirm things and going down a rabbit's hole a lot of time. But so anyways, um, going back to looking at opening day restaurants and interestingly, a lot of the, the restaurant themes that they had introduced in Walt Disney World were either duplications of ones that they had at Disneyland, honey, which you may be able to talk about, um, or they were, you know, maybe just uh, an upgrade from there. So um, maybe that's also how we can incorporate some of your great research as well. My great research, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, anyways, as I mentioned, I really, you know, in the past, I, I do like to keep with things that I feel are accurate when we're giving you information um, because believe it or not, the internet does have some things that are not accurate. So, nah, that's not true. I, I know. I hope that's not true because otherwise mine's probably all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. Let's get started though. We'll start on main street USA and, um, the, one of the first locations, actually, when you enter into the park, uh, when they opened in October of 1971, was Town Square Cafe. And that's actually in the location of Tony's Town Square Restaurant. And it was originally sponsored by Oscar Mayer. 
So they had the theming of hot dogs and sodas to really complement that Main Street USA kind of 4th of July celebration um, as you entered the park. Now, as we know, later on, it, it um, was reimagined into the Lady and the Tramp um, animated classic theme and started serving Italian cuisine. cuisine. Um, so it maybe not quite as much uh, involved in the theme of Main Street USA, but definitely a Disney classic. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was nice that they included Town Square in the new title. So it was originally Town Square Cafe, and now it's Tony's Town Square Restaurant. So at least they kind of tried to incorporate in the title some of the history of when the park first mm-hmm. opened. Yeah, for sure. So um, now Disneyland also had Town Square Cafe on and off between 1976 and 1992. And I don't know if you had experiences in that location. No, I think in my t- my times when I was going, when I was around that age, um, I was going mostly to the quick service yeah. restaurants. You know, <laughs> so, uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, time I spent in the table service right, restaurant. Right. So, I mean, I've, you know, I've seen a lot of them. Some of I remember, some I don't, mm-hmm. uh, but I can't say that I ever ate at that restaurant. Right. Well, it's interesting that it was, you know, on and off and I, I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but it was funny that it would, it would come and it would go and change to something else and come back to town square. <laughs> and leave. So it was funny that Disneyland was just kind of flip-flopping on that one. Yeah, so. and they, they've done that, you know, with several different things. I mean, there's a couple things here that I'm going to go through when we get to mine uh, that they've flip flopped on a couple of times that, uh, you know, because it's, you know, what strikes people at the time, right. what movies are popular, whatever. You know, there's a lot of reasons right. why uh, sure. they open and close and, exactly. you know, and theme these restaurants. Right, exactly. So. Um, Now, also on Main Street USA, but on the other end of it in uh, 1971 was Refreshment Corner, which was sponsored by Coca-Cola. This is the spot that we now know as Casey's Corner. Um, It was also in Disneyland on their opening day in 1955, also sponsored by Coke. And it's still that today at Disneyland. Yeah, exactly. I know exactly where that space is, kind of near the Jolly Holiday by the bakery. Right, right. So now the importance of sponsorship for Walt Disney's perspective was not just outsourcing and um, getting some funding for, for, you know, those locations, but he also felt that the brand names established confidence with the guests, you know, so that it was a familiar feeling to the park goers. So it kind of had that dual role. And so speaking of sponsorship, um, Now, we've just talked about Coca-Cola, but interestingly, over in Frontierland, when the park opened, was Mile Long Bar. And that was a co-sponsorship by Pepsi and Frito-Lay. So it's kind of interesting that both cola companies had sponsorship at Walt Disney World when they opened. Yeah, I don't think you'll see any Pepsi anywhere in the parks nowadays. It's all Coke now. But yeah, interesting. Well, you know. Uh, Roy and Walt trying to get as much <laughs> any way to get the money that they could uh, to fund these projects within the parks uh, early on for sure. Well, you know, when Walt Disney World opened because of the success of Disneyland, there was a lot of tremendous um, desire to be kind of linked with the mm-hmm. park. You know, the official airline, the official sugar, the official this. I mean, it was, you know, um, from what I saw, a lot of things like that that companies wanted to be linked with it as well so it doesn't surprise me that even though they were two sep- they're two separate cola companies that they were willing to be in the same layout yeah i'm sure as long as they weren't butting you know completely up against one another nearby it makes sense right right so um some other sponsorships that i thought were interesting was um there is the plaza ice cream parlor was sponsored by borden now we've seen that change over time the sponsorship but that's you know obviously borden milk was a very familiar product Mm -hmm. for people at that time so now another very important sponsorship was at the Sunshine Tree Terrace that served soft serve ice cream and citrus drinks. Um, and that was sponsored by the Florida Citrus Growers. And do you know who the first mascot of that location was? Was it Orange Bird? That's right. Yeah. Very popular now, Orange Bird. <laughs> yes. Uh, but actually, Orange Bird was popular back then. In fact, that symbolic mascot actually was in the park greeting guests who came to the um, that that 
uh, eatery. And although that the that famous bird did disappear for 25 years, he flew back to the Magic Kingdom in April of 2012. And in fact, the Walt Disney Imagineering team that was um, involved in the rehab for the Sunshine Tree Terrace decided that it would be fun to somehow bring back uh, the orange bird. And uh, they they found out or that somebody knew about that the original one of the original statues was being stored at the Walt Disney Imagineering studio in California. And so they did ask for that to be research and sure enough it was the original sculpture was found and brought back to the sunshine terrace and uh it's really just continued to grow in popularity in a big way i mean we see it in merchandising mm-hmm. and oh yeah as orange well. bird is huge now. it's huge it's one of the uh the 50 golden statues was orange bird right yeah. right so um it was so popular actually even in 1971 that believe it or not orange bird had its own song composed by the Sherman Brothers. Oh boy. And let's listen to a little of that. Gotta hear that. Yeah. So yeah, a, a kind of a cute little ditty Very of a cute. song. Yeah. <laughs> definitely Sherman Brothers style, and it's one of those that it can get into your head once you <laughs> learn it a little bit. I've heard it a couple times now, and and now when it plays, it's kind of stuck in there, just Boy, like small world. There we go. <laughs> So, um, which maybe have a topic we have coming up here eventually is we're going to do our five favorite songs that get stuck in your head that you don't mind it. Right. So, right. wonder if Orange Bird makes your list. We'll maybe, see. maybe. But it it was interesting finding out that that you know there was actually a little album that had a little forty five that had that song on there by the Sherman Brothers. So, um, definitely something that they were interested in promoting as part of the you know the theme park. Mm, yeah, I. I, I I knew that it was a big part of Walt Disney World and somewhat Disneyland, but more Walt Disney World. Um, you know, interesting because, you know, you think of obviously Florida mm-hmm. and Orange and Orange Bird, but also, you know, Disneyland grew out of Orange Grove. Right, so, right. Uh, yeah. Orange Bird fits in Disneyland as well. But, exactly. Uh, just interesting that uh, how, what the prominence was right. of, uh, of that bird. I, I mean, we knew now that the Orange Bird is adorable, cute shows up all the time <laughs> right but uh, to find out that it's it's been through the decades is cool yeah yeah so um and now that we're talking about adventureland there was one other uh restaurant that i want to mention that was uh there on opening day 50 years ago and that was adventureland veranda and that initially was also a fast food uh kind of with a tropical flair and what, what i found is it would have like on their burgers it would have teriyaki sauce and a pineapple ring so um but that actually closed in 1994 the space was kind of used um maybe for some special event kind of things some character meet and greets at times but in 2015 that restaurant reopened as jungle navigation company limited skipper canteen Mm. which is by far one of our favorites it's our favorite magic kingdom restaurant by far yeah not even close not even close yeah It's, it's a must do every time we're in magic kingdom right right so um so I guess I'll take a pause here before I go on. Is there anything like in from Disneyland where, because they also have, you know, obviously Main Street USA, Adventureland, some of the things that, you know, came to mind for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I have several here that uh, were interesting. I guess I can go to one of the Adventureland ones first since we were just in Adventureland. Mm-hmm. But um, there was a restaurant that it was entitled the, the Tahitian Terrace uh, that uh, opened. It ran, it was open mm-hmm. during the 60s in Adventureland. Polynesian themed restaurant, as you might expect from right. the Tahitian name. Uh, it served a lot of dishes like the skewered chicken, tropical fruit salad, Hawaiian mm-hmm. dishes, kind of similar to what you were just talking about. Right. Uh, they also had a show there that featured uh, native uh, Polynesian dancers cool. that would happen from time to time. It operated from 1962 all the way until 1993. Wow. So it had a pretty long run yeah. over there. Um, then it was replaced by, they decided yeah, maybe it wasn't working as well. And they had a hit movie that had come out uh, a few years earlier, mm-hmm. or right around that time. 
And so they replaced it with Aladdin's Oasis. Uh, so this became a spot where they would serve kind of more Americanized, Middle Eastern type food. Right. But they, when, when you would go there and dine, they would also do a show that would kind of tell the story of Aladdin. They had an cool. elaborate stage there and everything where they would do this. Uh, it only lasted a few years. I guess the, the fervor for Aladdin wore off or maybe it just became too difficult to run the show. And they would eventually, and this, we actually ate in Aladdin's Oasis for the um, to-go dinner packages right. that they would do for Fantasmic and sometimes for the, the sure. fireworks yeah, spectaculars that. or the uh, Main Street Electrical Parade right. or whatever. We ate there once uh, uh, for that purpose uh mostly it was they just didn't really do anything in there uh, i was closed off and it would just be a meet and greet for genie and aladdin or jasmine and, and right in front of it right however uh in 2018 they decided to reimagine it and it reopened and, and now we just ate there on one of our last trips to disneyland it is now nice. tropical hideaway yeah. uh kind of a jungle cruise slash enchanted tiki room theme right, right there overlooking uh the jungle cruise and it's a it's a fun little spot so uh, interesting how that uh, kind of uh just developed over the years uh, as we went through there so. oh yeah yeah i mean i could see at least from the small time the one time that i went there like you said when we were doing a um where we could get preferred uh viewing for the for the uh main street electrical parade um it it didn't seem like it was a big hit, you know, it, and it wasn't something that, e I mean, the food was fine, but it wasn't an atmosphere that we said, oh, let's do that again another time. But now I thought how the Imagineers re- did that location is awesome. I just love that it's uh, it's now it's uh, it's all open air space, you mm -hmm. know, and you can see the jungle crews come in and you know, they do have Rosita out there so you get a little taste of the enchanted tiki room there. Right, and, right. Uh, you know, it's not like an elaborate meal. We, you know, they, we got a couple bows and some dole whips, right, and, you know, right. and we were good. And that's pretty much what they serve there. You know, they have some lumpia and some other things. Um, but it, it's nothing like, it's not like the super hearty meal unless you buy a lot of things. Right, right. But it is a nice little light space for a snack, yeah. open air area. And I kind of like what they ended up doing with that area. Yeah. And it's nice to have another option of where to get a dole whip. Right. Because the other stand gets so busy. And even when you're doing mobile ordering, sometimes you could be standing in, in a fairly long line to get your mobile order. So it's great to have that other option. And when we did the uh, the ticketed event, the Disneyland After Dark mm -hmm. throwback night, they did bring back Polynesian dancers. And that's right. the space yes. where they were performing as well. So kind of, a, you know, also going back to right. that, referring to what that used to be the in history. that area. Yes, so, yeah. exactly. So. Exactly. Cool. Cool. All right. All right. So anything else there? Or shall we? Go? I've got some more things, but uh, why don't we go back to yours? Because okay. yours is much more interesting <laughs> than mine. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's jump back to the subject of the mile long bar um, from Frontierland. Now, it was there on October 1st, 1971 through to January 5th, uh, 1998. Now, when the mile long bar was there, um, one of the interesting things was you were conveniently guided <laughs> to enter it um, as you exited Country Bear Jamboree Show. Ah. And so uh, what was really cool is they actually had Melvin, Buff, and Max, you know, the talking heads, mm -hmm. on the walls there to greet guests as they were coming in for that dining experience. And as I mentioned before, it was uh, co-sponsored by Frito-Lay and Pepsi. Uh, so the food offerings at that time were pretty light fare, you know, some, you know, obviously Pepsi products and snacks from Frito-Lay. Um, now, fun fact is uh, it's called the Mile Long Bar because they had mirrors that they used to make it look so much longer to make you think it was a mile long. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why they gave it that name. Um, they also had the Mile Long Bar at Disneyland in 1972, so the year after the Magic Kingdom opened, and that was located in Bear Country. Um, later on, that restaurant became uh, renamed Breer Bar, and that uh, lasted from 1989 to 2002. Hmm. Um, now, I mentioned Frontierland, but do you know where Mile Long Bar was located? In Frontierland? Mm-hmm. Uh, wouldn't that be down kind of 
exit, he said it was exiting Country Bear Jamboree, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. So in that space, right? I don't know exactly. Yeah, so it, it kind of got uh, incorporated with Paco Bill's Tall uh-huh. Tale in Cafe. But now here's where I found some interesting things starting to, I don't know if you want to say unravel, but it's like, I can't figure this out. It's, it's a mystery to me because in some things that the Disney company puts out, they mentioned Paco Bill's was there on opening day. Hmm. However, as I mentioned at the very beginning, where they didn't have guidebooks, they had the newspaper. Paco Bills is not listed hmm. as an eatery on opening day. Hmm. Interesting. Right. So like D23 and Disney Park blogs are giving different information. And so it's like, I don't know what to say. Do we really say it was that Paco Bills was there on opening night? Or wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, Pecos Bills, I, I, I think I've seen the exact same thing because I was looking up for some artwork to try and mm-hmm. put into the episode and I saw some things with it there and not there. And so it's really, yeah, I don't know. Right. Now, another similar quandary happened in Fantasyland when looking things up. So um, it there's a place and it actually has had a high number of name and food changes. Um, it's, where Friar's Nook is. Mm. Okay. Now, according to that newspaper that's in Disney Parks blog on, you know, the opening, there are four food locations for Fantasyland. King Stefford's Banquet Hall in Cinderella Castle. And there's more controversy about that coming up. Mm. Uh, Pinocchio's Village House, which still exists. Different food. They spell the word house differently. (laughs) Um, Troubadour Tavern, which was next to Peter Pan's flight. And tournament tents near Dumbo attraction. Okay. But there's another food spot that is listed in a lot of things. And even, I mean, we, it definitely was there. It's called Lancer's Inn and it was at that location. But again, it was one of those situations where some things mentioned it as being present on opening day, but in that guidebook, AKA newsletter, newspaper, I mean, it wasn't listed. And so it's like, okay, there's no definitive answer here that we can really share with you. Um, we do know in this particular case, like I mentioned, Lancer's Inn was there somewhere early on. So whether it was actually opening day or shortly after that. Um, now, it in 1986 became Gertie's Munchy and Crunchy's Snack Bar. And that was to uh, give tribute to the Black Cauldron that had come out. Um, And it actually maintained that name until 1993, where it was reimagined to become Lumiere's Kitchen, which also made sense because of Beauty and the Beast that Mm -hmm. had happened in 1991. Then, (laughs) as I said, it had so many changes. In 2006, that spot became Village Fry Shop, uh, and it was, you know, mainly featuring like McDonald's French fries. Mm, I know. Pretty good. Yeah. But that only lasted three years because at that point uh, in 2009, the McDonald's were removed from the parks. You know, we saw them over at Epcot as well. Um, And that became the spot that we now know as Friar's Nook. Mm. Okay. All right. So what this research led me to believe is that because there weren't guidebooks, okay, and even when you do find some guidebooks of some of the earlier times that are that are on the internet there are different things that may be listed even around the same like in the same year whatever and so my humble opinion is when disney world first opened as we mentioned they were on a time crunch to get things finished and and yet they still had to get things printed right so it i could understand if maybe some things they weren't sure were going to be ready maybe And so at the time that they had to set to print, because they can't do it as quickly as print now. So back then, if they had to send something to the printers to get done in advance, they may not have wanted to take a chance maybe that something wasn't going to be open, so they didn't list it in the guidebooks. Mm. And then as as things became definite, then future printings, they had it included. 
Yeah, interesting. It's a, it makes sense to me. I mean, it's, yes, it's, it was much trickier back in the day to right. try and uh, put these things out. Uh, it's not like you can go on and just do a instant computer correction right. and, and then reprint a bunch of things exactly. you know, right there in the, you know, in the offices or whatever. So, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not sure. I don't have any proof of that, but it's just, you know, trying to figure out why when you go to research um, and you're seeing these discrepancies, you know, um, you know, and, and it's understandable too. like um, some of their maps, their early maps that they were actually selling them. They were, you know, large, you know, very colorful art, art drawn kind of um, pieces of uh, maps that they were selling. I could see them not wanting to take a chance at listing something that may not be open. Right. Although the funny thing is some of those did list things. So it's, <laughs> it's like whichever version and a lot of the early maps didn't seem to have dates on them. So um, they may have been from the same year, but, uh, you know, people might have purchased those at different times when things became definitively available in the parks. Yeah, uh, they, they may have only, you know, printed so many that they until we we're going to use these all up before we make the change. Right. Or whatever, so, right. Yeah. So. Anyways, do you want to share some of the other research things that you find? Um, sure. Well, let's go back to uh, to uh, Frontierland that okay. you were mentioning about. And this is in Disneyland Frontierland. There are a couple interesting restaurants there. Um, one that I got to experience myself. Another that I didn't. And the, probably the reason that I didn't get to experience it myself was because it, well... It'd be pretty culturally inappropriate <laughs> nowadays. <laughs> um, not that it wasn't a beloved uh, brand for a long, long time up until uh-huh. recently, but I think after a while, people were like, eh, you know, I don't know if this is probably it. And the food they were serving was very limited. But there was a place, and, you know, both, you know, the Magic Kingdom and Disneyland, you know, of obviously to get things started mm-hmm. uh there were sponsorships that were a big part of these right. restaurants these attractions mm-hmm. whatever to kind of get the funding in there and there was a restaurant in frontierland named aunt jemima's pancake house <laughs> oh yeah yeah see where that would be culturally yeah, appropriate yeah, nowadays yeah, yes right. yes uh, but it was there from uh august 17th in 1955 mm-hmm. so very early on right Till 1970, and obviously, what would they serve there? Pancakes, Pancakes and waffles. Yes. yes. Uh, and during the early days of the park, even they had an actress come out and play Aunt Jemima wow. to greet guests. Uh, it was uh, supposedly played by Eileen Lewis. Uh, she would come out there and greet guests to the restaurants wow. as Aunt Jemima. Yeah. It was renamed Aunt Jemima's Kitchen in 1962 and kept the name until 1970 when it eventually closed. Uh, One other interesting thing, in addition to the restaurant from 1957 to 64, uh, Disneyland apparently hosted an annual pancake race oh, wow. on National Pancake Day. I don't know what the pancake, maybe I don't know if that's you having to eat so many right, pancakes yeah. or what it was, but uh, interesting. But you can see um, it closed well before people would really question right. on, um, yes. was this okay to have open? Right, right. But it was an interesting place and it does show that, you know, the, the, the sponsorships, mm-hmm. one, sponsors wanted to be a part of Disneyland, right. two, that sponsorships were such a big thing. Right, so. right. Yeah. Like I said, I mean, it makes sense that, you know, especially at Disneyland when that was something newer that they wanted familiar things that people would feel comfortable about purchasing that food or whatever. Right. For sure. So another place that I actually did get to enjoy a couple times, um, but was one of kind of those places that we were just talking about before that would open, it would close, mm-hmm. it would change, it would move around and do different things. Um, and that is big thunder barbecue. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was an outdoor dining area located in a space that was called big thunder ranch at Disneyland kind of, behind Big Thunder Mountain. Kind of there's that path back behind uh-huh. Big Thunder that leads to Fantasyland. If you think of that space back there, uh, that was where Big Thunder Ranch was. And it opened uh, for a while back in 1986, uh, but it closed after a few reimaginings of the space uh-huh. in 1998, including at one point they had opened that area and uh, were doing a sort of outdoor stage show uh, called the Festival of Fools, uh, which was a retelling of the Hunchback wow. of Notre Dame, uh, which I loved. I thought it was spectacularly done. Uh-huh. I wish they, I, I could, I would go to it today if they were redoing it. Um, but they, 
it was interesting. Um, anyway, it closed in 1998. They would reopen it at certain different times, but then it reopened, not for good, but for a while back in 2009, uh, the a barbecue did, uh, where they would do kind of an all-you-care-to-enjoy uh barbecue and seasonal confections area where the, the menu included like chicken, pork, sausage, beans, corn cob, cornbread, coleslaw, lemonade, fruit cobbler. Meanwhile, musicians would perform traditional American country nice. type music and mm-hmm. uh, traditional music. And uh, they'd have sing-alongs out there along. There was a lot of fun to go eat there. You'd go to the barbecue, you load up, you right. know, is all you care to enjoy. So you can get all this barbecue, sit out on a picnic table nice. with a, you know, red and white checkered tablecloths yeah. out there and there's a band playing and everything it was a you cool. know outdoor space right. and the trees and everything if you think about that kind of area uh behind big thunder mountain mm-hmm. it was it was really a fun space of course it closed for good in 2016 because they decided well. they wanted to put together a space called star wars galaxy <laughs> edge <laughs> I understand. I <laughs> uh, love that space, but I get, especially right. in Disneyland with limited room, right. where is the most open space that they had? That was it. Sure. So they had to close it there. But that was a, a fun space that I enjoyed a few times. Cool. Um, I like barbecue. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the outdoor with the music and everything. It was it was a good time. And it definitely met the theming of Frontierland and things like that. Mm-hmm. So, cool. Uh, and moving over to Fantasyland, I'll just wrap up my, with I think one of the most interesting ones, and which was a, an actual landmark for Disneyland when it opened back in 1955. And also, again, bringing in the sponsorship, Mm -hmm. uh, there was a restaurant there that was called Chicken of the Sea Pirate (laughs) Ship. Uh, And yes, it was a (laughs) full pirate ship. Uh, It was actually a landmark back there in Fantasyland for a long time. It opened, yes, when Disneyland opened in 1955 in Fantasyland. Quick service restaurant uh, aboard this pirate ship. It's Chicken of the Sea. They served a lot of tuna Tuna. dishes. Yes, (laughs) including like a tuna burger and stuff. You know, what would you expect? Right. Uh, It was one of the uh, central icons of the original Fantasyland. And they further expanded it in 1960 by the added Skull Rock there as uh-huh. well to fully pull on the uh, the Captain Hook uh, theming. Uh, however, in 1969, Chicken of the Sea, okay, we're good. We're moving on. Right. <laughs> they dropped it and they renamed it to Captain Hook's Galley uh, was what that space was. Um, and it would still stay open for a while until uh, 1982 uh, when it closed for Fantasyland expansion. Um, the original plan was they were going to relocate the ship to a new spot in the Small World Promenade, but uh, well, it'd been in water for a while, and there was a lot of damage to it. So they, just, yeah, unfortunately, they couldn't, uh, they couldn't do anything with it. They did tear it down. However, some of the props and the rigging for the ship uh, were saved, and they're actually you, you can find them now in the refurbishment of the ship at Peter Pan's flight. Wow. Some of that is left over, uh, according to very my cool. very not very good research. <laughs> everything on the internet is true, uh, is whatever it is now. But I just thought, and you see the pictures of it. Uh, it was just really cool. I vaguely remember it from when I was a child seeing uh-huh. the pirate ship there. I think for a time being, after the restaurant closed, they used it as kind of a walk-through attraction where there was no restaurant, but you could kind of walk mm-hmm. onto the pirate ship and everything. Gotcha. But, um, just I, I thought that that was such a, a huge landmark and an right. opening day restaurant that it had to be brought up. So that's yeah. the conclusion of my limited research. <laughs> Let's wrap it up with more of Michelle's awesome, awesome research. Oh, you're sweet. Well, actually, we're going to finish this segment off with, um, as I mentioned earlier, the issue of King Stephen's Banquet Hall. Um, that was a flagship opening day restaurant, uh, definitely in a very prominent location. Uh, there was they're great theming, tons of theming related to that restaurant. Like they had hand stitch medieval banners hanging overhead. Um, they had uh, for the servers, very ornate 13th century costumes. They even had singing mandrigal singers. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. Um, there's also 40 coats of arms on display. And each coat of arm uh, symbolizes somebody who who supposedly played a a considerable role in the history of Walt Disney Company, including Imagineers like Mark Davis, John Hench, and Marty Sklar, and then some members of the uh, Disney family, including Roy. Kind of like, I guess, the idea of Main Street, you know, windows. Um, But but let's look at the name. (laughs) King Stefan, (laughs) who was the father of Aurora from Sleeping Beauty, but in a place 
inside a very iconic Cinderella's castle. Right. <laughs> it's like, well, what's up with that? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't make a lot of sense, does right? it? Right, right. Cinderella Castle, Sleeping Beauty, that yeah, would make more sense at Disneyland. Exactly. Or at uh, Disneyland Paris. Right. So um, now according to D23 Archives, the Disney Archives said the designers have not really been able to explain why Cinderella's castle held King Stefan's banquet hall. Um, and it's definitely a question that cast members had to deal with for many years. In fact, 26 years um, until they renamed it Cinderella's Royal Table in 1997. So let's just call it folklore of unconfirmed rationale for that name of King Stephen is that supposedly, according to the internet, um, that the original <laughs> Magic Kingdom design team really wanted to give, um, they, they considered that like the crown jewel eatery, and they wanted to give it a very regal name. Um, but none of the characters in, in Cinderella really fit the bill for that. And the king in Cinderella isn't even named. So they took to Sleeping Beauty's father um, and lent that name to uh, the banquet hall and... Uh, Really, though, if you think about it, it's really not characteristic of what the Imagineers would do. Um, that is, as I say, I'll say that's folklore. That's what I found on the Internet, but it was not confirmed. In fact, D23 Disney Archives said they really couldn't confirm why that name was given. Hmm. But anyways, uh, who would have ever guessed after doing this research that Disney World guidebooks, restaurant names and maps would hold such mystery and in intrigue? <laughs> <laughs> but there they do. <laughs> well, now we know. Michelle is an avid collector of Disney maps. Like, we cannot <laughs> leave the park without her collecting four or five maps. And now we know why, because she's piecing together this little mystery right. <laughs> of what happens in the park. So eventually, hey, Disney Archives, uh, we have somebody here who is an avid researcher <laughs> who loves the, this kind of stuff. If you're looking for somebody right. to head uh, this up or be a part of your <laughs> Disney archives, uh, Michelle would be perfect yeah, for that. That so. would be a dream job. That would be a dream job for sure. But yeah, I, like I said, I mean, you know, having to try to understand why things aren't piecing together, you know, you could throw it like we throw we threw out a theory. I have no idea. But, you know, I'm just trying to take a look at the times and how things worked and what they were going through you know, it's not totally unaccept unacceptable to expect to see, um, or I should say it's not unexpected to see some mystery. Yeah. Interesting stuff. Conflicts. Good stuff. Michelle's research. Always the best <laughs> research. Mine. <laughs> no, you had some really interesting <laughs> stories there. I love what, some of the stories. How story. much of it is true? <laughs> <laughs> We don't really know, uh, but we'd love to know if you've uh, dined at any of these restaurants from mm -hmm. the past or if there's some that we left out that were some of your favorites. Hit us up uh, social media through our Gmail account, right. whatever, and let us know. Yeah. And that is our look at old school Magic Kingdom and Disneyland, Disneyland, <laughs> Disneyland, <laughs> Disneyland restaurants from the past. So it's always fun bringing up that nostalgia mm -hmm. and some of the fun. It's uh, funny because Michelle's like, I think I have like 20 minutes worth of stuff for this <laughs> week. I'm like, great. We're going to have a short episode this week. We went a little long last week. That's fine. And then we go on for 45, 50 minutes talking about <laughs> all these restaurants. So uh, let's get to our Disney stories of the week. And I'm going to start with if you've been wondering when you'll be able to access Genie, Genie Plus. Yeah etc at Walt Disney World well it's coming yeah. soon this from the Disney Parks blog they said we're excited to share that the previously announced Disney Genie service will launch on October 19th, 19th. at Walt Disney World Resort so uh, just a little over a week mm -hmm. away until that will be happening for you when you're out there they went on to say that Genie, uh, Disney Genie uses our 50 plus years of knowledge and expertise on how guests visit our parks to make the experience better for everyone. With this launch, we'll also be introducing the Lightning Lane entrance. Yes, mm -hmm. that will be open at the same time, available for purchase 
through their Genie, Disney Genie Plus add-on at more than 40 locations or individually a la carte, as it will, at some of uh, their most highly demanded attractions. The Lightning Lane entrance can save you uh, time waiting in line. So you will have that option as referenced before. Uh, it's for Genie Plus that will cost you $15 per guest for the day, if you decide you want to do that, you can do that. I think it's anywhere as long as you have a park reservation for that park anytime uh, after midnight on the day of your park reservation. Uh, and and then you can uh, start accessing those attractions, whether you're staying on property or whether you're not, uh, beginning at 7 a.m. Now, for the Lightning Lane, the a la carte ones, mm -hmm. Um, those are going to be, uh, and this is according to multiple sources, they're going to range in prices from $7 to $15 per guest, depending on the popularity of the attraction, mm -hmm. how busy the parks are, how busy that queue is, whatever. Right. So it can fluctuate at one point of the day. It might be a different price than another part of the day. Now, if you're staying on property on Disney, you can book your first one of those beginning at 7 a.m. For those of you staying off property that decide to use this mm -hmm. function, uh, you will need to wait until uh, the park opens. So just know that that's a small right. advantage if you're looking to do something like that when you're staying on Walt Disney World Resort space. Right. Yeah. So it's very exciting. And, um, you know, even the, the free portion of uh, Genie actually sounds like a great service that I'm looking forward to trying out. Yeah. And then if you do are going to do a attraction heavy day, mm -hmm. uh, maybe you look into the uh, the uh, Genie Plus right. uh, where you can, you know, you book your fast passes, essentially fast passes, uh, booking the lightning lanes. I, I got to get fast pass out of my mind right. now, I guess. The other thing I like about Genie Plus um, is that even if you have an annual pass, you can just get it for the one day which when we had the Disneyland annual passes and you wanted to do, uh, what was it? Called? Max Pass. Max Pass. You know, you were purchasing it for the whole, you know, you, you paid a lump sum to have it for the whole year, um, which you may or may not have wanted. So this is nice that it has that option that you can just do it a day at a time. Yeah, it came along with the price of some of the uh, higher tiered annual passes mm -hmm. um, for Disneyland. Right. And then for some of the lower tiers, you could add it on for a separate price, which is if you were going and using it a lot, uh, it probably would end up saving you money in the right. long run versus purchasing it per day. But anybody could have annual pass, ticket holder, whatever, just similar to Genie Plus, uh, bought the max pass on the day they were attending the parks. Oh, didn't realize Yeah, that. yeah. So yeah, I'm interested to see how people use this. Uh, again, I don't think it's something that we will use a lot of, just because we're not attraction heavy, mm -hmm. um, usually people at the parks. Um, I think if we're with family or friends that do right. want to go a lot of attractions, then we might look into it, especially right. someplace like Magic Kingdom where there's a lot of attractions. Um, you know, and I, I do see it as a purpose for those people that, you know, they, they don't get to go very often. Right. You know, I really want to be able to ride Rise of the Resistance. Or right. I really want to be able to ride Ratatouille or whatever the attraction right. exactly. is. Um, you know, purchasing that, you know, no if you purchase that lightning lane pass for whatever the price, at least, you know, you're going to do it. You're not going to disappoint right. uh, your children or yourself uh, that you went on this trip that you spent a lot of money on. And yes, you're going to have to spend a little more money, but um, at least you know that you got right. that done. So yeah, exactly. It will be interesting to see how it plays out. Now, uh, moving on, we received some great news about entertainment that will be returning to the most magical place as mm -hmm. on earth as well in the very near future. Again, we address the Disney parks blog as we, usually do because <laughs> usually they are the best source as we, apparently we heard today not always but well, no i think they're a good source but it's just you no. never have good explanation always the best source for official disney news right uh, I mean, not that there aren't other sites that give disney news out there but you, you know when it's coming from the disney parks right. it's coming from Disney itself. So anyway, they said, we're thrilled to tell you we're bringing back more entertainment cast members this fall as we relaunch some favorite live entertainment experiences at Yay. all four theme parks and beyond. Yeah. 
So next week at Disney's Animal Kingdom theme park, guests visiting Asia can once again enjoy the music of Chakranadi and Kora Tinga Tinga. Uh, they return to the streets of Arambe in Africa, and you can look for the Tam Tam drummers to come back to Africa in nice. early November. So that's a lot of fun. It's always kind of cool when you're walking through Arambe right. and through Africa, then when they have some of those live performers there, exactly. and just get you moving as you're, you're trekking through going to Kilimanjaro Safari. Right. Festival of the Lion King, whatever it may be. Yeah, it just adds to that ambiance and that feel of authenticity. Yeah, for sure. Uh, performers will also soon be captivating guests strolling along the waterfront at Disney's Boardwalk Resort and the intimidable Yeehaw Bob Yay! will have his audience in stitches of fun starting on October 14th at the River Roost Lounge at Disney's Port Orleans Resort Riverside. We mentioned this a yep. few episodes back that he had posted that on his Facebook page mm-hmm. that he was coming back. This is officially from Disney. Right. So, uh, you know, even though that was from Yeehaw Bob, right. you know, so pretty much the source <laughs> this is officially from disney so you know it's going to happen so that's exciting so just a few more days till yeehaw bob is back at right. uh, port orleans riverside that's great news uh also over the past year beloved disney characters have been popping up in cavalcades motorcades flotillas and surprise signings much to the light of guests and they're pleased to tell you that many of those experiences will be continuing although the environment it's not right just yet for hugs and autographs you soon however will be able to have more individual Individualized time with some of your favorite characters, getting to visit with them in a themed location and snap a photo or two. So yes, meet and greets, mm-hmm. although slightly different, they are coming back to the Walt Disney World Resort. Right, which is good. I mean, we've experienced something I think similar at Disneyland, where you know at Avengers Campus, you can get you know close enough to have a conversation. Uh, with some of the the people there um, and uh, as well as uh, in the hub at California Adventure Park you can talk to some of them and get selfies etc um, so it's it's a great experience right exactly it's it's a lot of fun love the characters at uh, Disneyland and love the characters at Walt Disney World and so a lot of these places mm-hmm. are going to be the spaces you remember uh, from when you were meeting the characters in the past I uh, look for the Disney princesses to return to Princess Fairy Tale Hall in Magic nice. Kingdom Park. At Disney's Hollywood Studio, you'll soon find Minnie Mouse at Red Carpet Dreams and the stars of Disney Junior in the Animation Courtyard. And and when you stopped in to see Mickey Mouse backstage at Town Square Theater on Main Street USA, he'll be sporting his all-new iridescent look designed just for the Walt Disney World 50th anniversary celebration. Each of these locations is planned to start welcoming guests in November. So uh, if you have a trip scheduled for November and you're looking to get back to some of those character meet and greets again you're not going to be able to give them a hug quite right. yet um but it's going to be a little bit more individualized right. s- situation it'll be nice to interact yes exactly yeah. so uh november 7th also marks the return of disney movie magic the cinematic nighttime experience at disney's hollywood studio celebrating disney's live action film legacy and when this projection show resumes it will feature a new sequence from disney's epic adventure mulan nice so that'll be great you know it's kind of a projection on Grauman's Chinese yeah, Theater there. Awesome. Um, I'm sure they will, They usually have you know, some light fireworks. It's right. not like a full fireworks show, but right, some light but fireworks, sometimes lasers and some other things to go along with exactly. it. Exactly. Good that that's returning. And be sure to mark your calendars for December 19th when the cast and crew of Indiana Jones Epic yes. Stunt Spectacular bring back all the comedy and thrills of that action-packed show uh, so glad that that's coming back. We'd heard some rumors about that a few months ago right. that they're starting to try and, you know, get the cast and crew together to do some rehearsals of maybe a slightly changed show for, you know, what the circumstances right. are nowadays. But so glad that it's, it's coming back. And, it, you know, I, I want, Disney Hollywood Studios needs a show like that right. back and to kind of be a people eater right. uh, for certain times of the day. And just, in, you know, Indiana Jones, the new movie's coming right. before too long. So let's start pumping. Let's hype, exactly. get that Indiana Jones hype train going, right? Right, right. Yeah, no, it's great. And it's just, you know, continued expansion or return to uh, fun that we've experienced in the past. So yeah, and just great 
great, forward to it. Just great to hear that entertainment yeah. is coming back mm-hmm. in, in, these, in many different ways, shapes, and forms right. uh, throughout the Walt Disney World Resort, Disneyland Resort, Disney Cruise Line. Uh, just It's really good to hear that, and hopefully it's steps in the right direction. Exactly. Uh, back over here at the Disneyland Resort, we got good news about a fun new shop aimed at you holiday fans that will be opening very soon. Again, the Disney Parks blog, they said... We're excited to tell you about a very special new shop opening soon at Disneyland Park. It's an all-new holiday store called Plaza Point coming to the corner of Main Street USA and East Plaza Street. It's kind of where, from what I understand, the old photo supply company shop was located there on the corner Uh across from the Emporium area. They go on to say this Victorian era space will envelop you in the warmth of the holidays as soon as you step into the wood paneled space decorated with garlands, nutcrackers, and festive decor. Careful observers will notice displays that reflect seasonal holidays around the world and their ongoing commitment to diversity and inclusion. And once the store opens, you'll see a variety of holiday goods available to purchase for yourself or as gifts for family and friends, including ornaments, housewares, uh, linens, and accessories. And you'll want to visit throughout the year because other holidays like Hanukkah, Lunar New Year, spring and Easter, and fall and Halloween will be reflected in the merchandise and the store decor uh, at appropriate times as well. So it's not just a Christmas shop. Like, you know, the Christmas shop at Liberty Square in Magic Mm -hmm. Kingdom. Um, This will be kind of a all holiday right. shop. I'm sure that there'll be a lot of focus on Christmas there, sure. but you can, it sounds like you're going to be able to find all sorts of different type of holiday right. accoutrement. Right. It'll be fun to find seasonal things and like have a honed in spice for it rather than trying to like go through the Emporium and, you know, you find a little splattering here and there, mm-hmm. but to really have like a central location, it's uh, especially for the holidays, very convenient. Yeah. I'm, I'm really excited for this. I think it's going to be a uh, great, uh, no official word on when the shop is opening, but it appears it could be very soon. They did a video kind of a walkthrough of it on Disney parks blog. It looks great. Um, and you know, with it being smack dab in the middle of holiday season between Halloween now, right. Thanksgiving coming up, and then Christmas, I I would I don't know why they'd be waiting. They, I'm right, pretty sure exactly. this will be opening pretty soon. So uh, we'll let you know, and I'm sure the Disney Parks blog will let you know before we do. So uh, be sure and check back for all that. Now, uh, moving on, Disney Cruise Line passed along some details about some cool spaces for kids, tweens, and teens aboard the Disney mm-hmm. Wish. So you know, we talked about the parks. Disney right. Cruise Line did not want to be left out of today's high period of interest <laughs> podcast. Uh, again, right back to the Disney Parks blog. They said, if you've been following along as we unveil the Disney Wish, then you already know that the newest Disney line, uh, Disney Cruise Line ship will feature a totally reimagined Disney's Oceaneer Club where ages kids ages 3 to 12 will experience the worlds of Marvel superheroes, Disney princesses, Frozen Friends and Disney Imagineers in brand new ways. Well, they say we're also excited to share that there's even more fun awaiting kids in this real life wonderland, including two more magical experiences debuting in Disney's Oceaneer Club aboard the Disney Wish next summer. Uh, This one. I want to get in the, I I hope there's an open house for it because uh, this is really cool. Uh, The peculiar creatures and legendary characters of the Star Wars galaxy will take center stage at Star Wars Cargo Bay. Nice. They say this first of its kind immersive experience will place kids in the important role of creature handlers (laughs) as they learn to manage a mischievous menagerie of exotic beings from across the galaxy, including a porg, loath cat, wart, and more. (laughs) Uh, Throughout the cruise, they'll use augmented reality enabled data pads to track and study the creatures on a series of special assignments. But there's more to this job than meets the diagnoga eye. <laughs> the new crew will actually be joining an important mission to deliver a pair of secret stowaways, Ray and Chewbacca, back Ooh. to the resistance. Yes. Nice. So it's not just the creatures. Right. There's some important stowaways going on here. Uh, during the interactive Star Wars Creature Challenge experience, the newly minted caretakers will be put to the test as they help feed the lifelike creatures and encounter some of the most dangerous beings in the galaxy. When things go awry, they'll need to call on the expertise of Ray and Chewbacca and even channel the force to secure the ship from its destruction. Nice. I I, I said, I I hope we get to do the open house and experience that because I want to do that. I want to do all of that. That sounds fun. Yeah. It's, it's great to see that they're really um, bringing some more, 
newer exciting things to you know the uh oceaneers club and and such a a, a disney cruise line because i mean they they do a lot of wonderful things but it's great to see that they're continuing to actually put the time and energies and monies into making it even more interesting especially for families who return to cruising more often and finding the kings the things that kids love nowadays right. you know i mean they they do and for better or for worse, you know, data pads, right. screens, essentially, you know, the kids like that kind of stuff and yeah. being able to use them uh, to do different things. Right. And, you know, this is seems like something that you can do. Yes, yes, using something they are very much more using the data pads, right. the iPads, the tablets, whatever, right. um, but also using it in a way to not just sit and right. you know do this, actually get out and explore the Oceaneer Lab and maybe right. the ship or whatever the Oceaneer Club, and uh, check us all out. So that's you know that's good because kids can uh, relate to that. Right, exactly. And I think we've shared in the past that when we've done some of these open houses, um, what we were seeing sometimes were just you know, maybe uh, availability of video games for kids, but they already have access to that. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't anything that was unique to them in an an experience on the cruise, whereas this will definitely be something For sure, for sure. Uh, They also mentioned that especially designed for the youngest sailors at Disney's Oceaneer Club, Mickey and Minnie's Captain's Deck is a brand new thing that's coming. It's a nautical playground inspired by the colors, icons, and magic of Disney Cruise Line. This brand new space will be filled with an array of maritime themed physical and sensory style games and activities such as pipe slides and crawl throughs, ship's wheels, busy boxes fashioned as ship controls, and cushy life preserver uh, seating areas. Uh, this is when the little cadets. These are so these are for the younger ones, right. you know. When the little cadets enter the space, they'll set sail on a fun-filled adventure and enjoy quality playtime with Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse themselves. At select times throughout the voyage, the space will be open to little ones' families for group play as well. Nice. So that's nice. Yeah. So you can get them, you know, sometimes mm-hmm. people wonder going on the ship. It's like, you know, you put the, the kids go to the clubs right. and they don't ever want to leave, right. but you want some family time. Well, now you can kind of get a little bit of both. Exactly. From this. Yeah. And the toddlers from it's a small world nursery will also get dedicated access to the club to explore, learn and play with Mickey and Minnie. So even the really, really tiny right. ones are going to get a chance to get in there and try this. Uh, they say the signature experience will be Minnie's Captain Academy, a high energy training session for kids to e- exercise their bodies through playful games, dancing and maritime drills, quote unquote, <laughs> and their minds testing their imagination and ingenuity during a series of challenges tied to STEAM principles, science, technology, engineering, arts and mathematics. Captain Minnie will inspect their progress and officially declare them honorary captains. I think that's nice, really cool. That so, is. yes, they're going to be having a lot of fun, but it's not just mindless stuff. Right. You know, it's going to be physical. It's going to be mental. It's a, it's a great approach that for young edutainment. ones. Edutainment. Yes, exactly. So yeah. that's just really cool stuff. So, uh, But younger kids aren't the only guests receiving bright and shiny new spaces aboard Disney's great new ship. Ooh, yes. yes. Uh, older kids ages 11 to 17 will chill and play in their own way aboard the Disney Wish with trendy hangouts and counselor-led programming created just for them, featuring all new looks that combine sophisticated design with useful Disney touches. These clubs will be bursting with creative design details, comfortable lounge spaces, and high-tech entertainment. Now, again, this is from the Disney Parks blog, so if it reads like a brochure, (laughs) you know why. Um, They say at Edge, tweens ages 11 to 14 will have fun make friends, and play games in a bright, colorful hangout inspired by a chic New York City loft. The club will include cozy furnishings, comfortable niches for solo gaming and movie watching, and a soda bar. Edge will also feature an indoor solarium area with a sunny overhead skylight effect, carpet uh, patterned with fresh grass and daisies, a back wall mural of a bright blue sky, and games inspired by a colorful outdoor city park. So kind of the, the feeling of being outdoor right. in a park, yeah. although it's indoor, but right. yeah, kind of a cool space. It really looks amazing. Yeah. Uh, throughout Edge, graphic art displays known as photo walls. We all know that the <laughs> tweens nowadays have got to get their photo yeah. walls in, right? Yeah. And some of the adults as well. <laughs> uh, they will provide ample opportunities for tweens to capture cool, shareable vacation pics that will surely be the envy of their friends back home. Again, Disney realizing what people are wanting nowadays right. what these tweens want nowadays and they're 
giving you access to that on the brand new ship. Right. They do great research and, you know, it's really amazing how they can conceptualize some of these most amazing, like you say, spaces and activities. And it, it was really great to see that. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, this also moves into the actual teens as well, because at Vibe, teens ages 14 to 17 will meet new friends, watch movies, play games, and participate in entertaining activities created just for them, inspired by a Parisian artist loft. This stylish space will feature classical architectural elements like regal French columns and paneled walls covered with whimsical pop art murals and colorful graffiti, as well as a traditional French Morris column plastered with Disney-inspired travel posters. Posters, Ooh. cool. Uh, the decor will feature an electric retro twist with vibrant neon signs and funky pop art throughout, uh, accentuated by a larger-than-life, brightly painted Mickey Mouse statue. Uh, combine all of that with the floor-to-ceiling windows overlooking the ocean, and every angle in vibe will offer a selfie-worthy backdrop for the trendiest teens on the high seas. Nice. Yeah, really cool. Also, for the first time on a Disney ship, the Disney Wish will feature a third retreat for tweens and teens. Yeah, Ooh. it's called the Hideaway. This hip new hangout will offer older kids and young adults another place to relax, sip a smoothie, listen to music, and more in a posh setting complete with a dance floor and DJ booth, perfect for karaoke contests and dance competitions. The Hideaway will be adorned with a vibrant color palette, retro-inspired design detail, a stylized Hiya Pal <laughs> mural and disco ball nights. Adjacent to Vibe, this flexible venue can be open to the teen club, closed off for uh, tween activities, and also be reserved spe- uh, especially for guests ages 18 to 20. So kind of that group that right. you know is in that space, and they can't get to these clubs. Right. They can't quite get into the lounges right, yet, right. so they can have that kind of space as well. So all this is just... I'm so excited for yes. the Disney Wish. Uh, all this stuff. I mean, we're probably not going to get into Vibe or Edge. Right. You know, I mean, there's sometimes have open houses there right. so you can check it out too, but it's not going to be really a space for us. But I'm just excited that it all exists out there. Yeah, it's just great that this ship is going to really hold some new fun adventures for, for people of all ages in the family. Mm-hmm, for sure. So that's it for the Disney stories of the week. However, we never leave you without giving you some sort of tip that might help you on your next vacation. And, and we always start with Michelle. One, because she's gorgeous, <laughs> wonderful, intelligent, hardworking. So she obviously does the best research. We know she has the best <laughs> list, but she definitely has the very best tips. So let's get to it. Here's Michelle's tip of the week. Well, thank you, honey. Um, So my tip is actually called super seats and it's kind of how to have maybe a the best experience ever when you're visiting a Disney park and going on an attraction um, and I first want to say the Disney cast members they're amazing and they really do want to try to make sure every guest every person coming through has a wonderful time and they actually are empowered to use some um, pixie dust of their own and and that could be in terms of looking for a great seat and you may have it for one a specific seat on an attraction for a particular reason Um, for example like um, with our son Scott he really likes to be in the front row especially of Small World or Winnie the Pooh uh, the many adventures of Winnie the Pooh so um, you know if you just go up to the cast member with, you know, the understanding that they can't guarantee the requests are, are granted every time, um, but that if they could try to accommodate your request, ask for that seat, like ask for the front row. Or, um, for example, in Star Tours, if you're the, the last row is a little bit raised. So if you're a little bit height challenged, uh, you might have a different experience because you have more of a dangly leg kind of situation <laughs> as the room is moving around. Um But, you know, I think the first and foremost is to understand, you know, greeting the cast member and giving them the the knowledge that you know that they might not be able to accommodate it, but if possible to accommodate your request for a particular seat. Yeah, we do it all the time. Uh, mm-hmm. We may sometimes have to wait, you know, like it won't be the, the next uh, attraction car that right. comes through. You may have to wait through, uh, you know, a, a rotation or whatever, but uh, they will do everything they can to get you in that car that you, in that seat that you want. Right. Um, whether it be the front row, if it's on a thrill ride, sometimes you different different experience in the back car of that right. as well. And sometimes you don't want either of those. You just want to be seated somewhere in the middle. Right. You can just tell them that and they'll put you, you know, when they can, right. where you want to be. 
Right. And just to also understand and um, be aware that on, you know, like maybe really busy times of the year when the lines are crazy long, it might be very difficult for them in some of these uh, attractions to be able to set you aside for that. Uh, so just be understanding of it and, you know, be respectful. But, but like I said, for the most part, I would say 99% of the time, they have always been very willing to accommodate our requests. Almost always. Yep. Uh, rarely have we not had the ability right. to pick whatever row we want and we just had to wait a little longer for right. it. So, so anyway. Michelle's tip, always the best <laughs> tip. Uh, my tip really quickly is I just want to send out a reminder to people out there that when you're staying at a uh, Disney cruise line mm-hmm. or at a Disney resort to remember that, you know, you know obviously the best thing to do is uh, uh, and you should, and they'll probably ask for you to do this, attach a credit card or a debit card to your account there mm-hmm. for any, you know, charges in the parks, any charges at the hotel, any other incidentals that may come along, you definitely want to do that. But you can put uh, pay for things in other ways as well. Um, you can also use Disney gift cards. You can right. go right to guest relations or to the front desk and tell them, look, I have these Disney gift cards. I want to put that mm-hmm. towards all my charges. Um, also, you know, uh, you may have a Disney Visa rewards card, mm-hmm. which we are going to put to good use on our <laughs> Disney cruise Coming up here in December, as a matter of fact, I think our entire Remy dinner is going to be paid by (laughs) Disney Rewards points, which is going to be really, really nice. Um, You may want to use that, uh, you know, get your Disney Redemption card points and use that first. All you got to do is is let them know when you go up there. Yes, I have, you know, when I checked in, Mm -hmm. I had a credit card or a debit card attached to my account, but I have these ways of paying as well. Um, Can you put that and you just tell them what order you want them to be charged in. So if you want your Redemption card charged first, like charge that and then everything else else on the credit card. If you have gift cards, same thing. Right. Charge these gift cards first and then we'll go to the other ways. And of exactly. course, you can always pay cash as right. well at the end of the... I mean, you can't... I mean, I, I think you can go up there and tell them put a deposit down for right. a certain amount, but best to just hold off on that to the end. But there are different ways to pay for your... You know, if you want to kind of pair back on what's right. on your credit card, if, you know, we're getting to the holiday season, people buy you Disney gift cards, right. whatever, um, you can put those to help you or even just booking your trip in general. Yeah. You just put those to good use. Good. Good tip, honey. Yes. Not as good as your tip. Oh, but yes, thank good. you. <laughs> so that's it for this week. Uh, next week, well, we're quickly approaching Halloween and we're very excited yeah. for it. So we thought we'd celebrate with another topic type that you've told us many times is one of your favorites. Yes. It's another five favorite list. This time, including music. So yeah. yes, those are really like, like you look at our top downloaded episodes, right. like almost all of them are five favorite with music right. involved with them. So this uh, should be a fun one. And I think it's especially fun because since it's the spooky season, we're going to do our five favorite Disney Halloween type songs. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, and of course we'd love your input on that as well. We want to know your five favorite and we'll right. share those on the show as well. Exactly. So, so looking forward to that one. Yes. So uh, we appreciate that you joined us today. In the future, you can find us most everywhere you get podcasts. However, the very best place to find us is on our own website, HyperionAdventuresPodcast.com. And while you're there, we'd really like you to sign up for our newsletter. Yep. Please sign up for the newsletter. Just another way to be involved in the Hyperion Adventures podcast world. Also, you can follow us on social media. Please check us out on Twitter at Hyperion Podcast, Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest at Hyperion Adventures Podcast. If you are on Facebook, come on down and yes. join us in our Hyperion Adventurers Facebook group just for a great space for positive Disney energy out there. Uh, we're also on YouTube. Just do a search for Hyperion Adventures Podcast. Hit subscribe and you'll know whenever we have a new video. And if you ever want to contact us for any reason, please hit us up at our Gmail account. Hyperion Adventures Podcast at gmail.com. Right. We'd love to hear from you, whether it's to say hello or ask questions, etc. And the other thing we really like to do is ask for you to please tell a friend about our podcast. Yep, that's the easiest way for people to find out that this show exists and that others might enjoy it just like you do. At least we hope you enjoy it. (laughs) (laughs) That's it. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Hyperion Adventures Podcast. We look forward to sharing some time with you again next week. Until that time, I'm Tom. I'm Michelle. And we hope that you have a magical week. Bye.